Welcome to a new episode of Morelia Python Radio. And in this episode, we are talking with Darren and Daniel Boswell. They are a father and son team that share their passion for reptiles. We are going to talk about Daniel's amazing group of green pythons, Darren's own belly pythons. We'll get some field herping, some of the other projects that they were involved with. Owen won't be here. Uh, he's fine, but he had to sit this episode out, but he will be back next week. So let's get this started. All right, welcome to another episode of Morelia Python Radio, and tonight we are joined by Darren and Daniel Boswell. We're going to be talking about chondros, we're going to be talking about Owen Pellies, we're going to be talking about Herpin Australia, all kinds of stuff, naturalistic enclosures. Um, I don't think that we've ever talked to somebody that has actually kept an Owen Pelly python, so that will be, uh, that will be really cool. Um, and Owen is not here tonight uh, because uh, he is uh, recovering from his uh, surgery. And uh, yeah, we'll be uh, he'll be back on the next episode. But tonight it's just us. Welcome, guys. Glad to have you on NPR. I know we've been trying to do this for a while, so uh, yeah. glad to finally make it happen. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, so we so Owen came up with some new questions uh, to start the show. Other than how did you get into reptiles and all that stuff, but. Um, I'm going to go over a couple of them and you guys can just go from there and then we'll get into the, to the good stuff, the chondros and the, and, oh, I forgot Antaresia. Oh man, there's so much to talk about. So <laughs> we'll get, we'll get into it. So what, um, why do you keep snakes as opposed to geckos and monitors? What, what is it about snakes? Uh, well, for me, I've, I've just. Yeah, I'm just more of a snake guy, I guess. Um, I have had a few species of small monitors in the past. Um, had uh, stores monitors, Aki's, uh, Barichi monitors, and you know they're they're great. But I just found that yeah, that they needed, more, I guess, more daily hands-on care and yeah. and <laughs> um, you know having wood cockroaches and crickets all over the place and all that sort of thing. It uh, it was more my partner's thing. She was interested in them. That's why we got them. And then her interest sort of waned and it all just fell on me. So, uh, yeah, moved out of it. But just always being a Python person, really. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Daniel? I guess for me, um, growing up, Dad always made me had snakes in the collection. Um, you know, the monitors and lizards were really cool, but I guess I just developed a bigger appreciation for the snakes that he was keeping. And yeah, it just took hold from there. I can relate to that. Your your dad having an influence on uh, <laughs> on your reptile keeping yeah. for sure. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. Um, so, did you guys have a role model or mentor coming up? As uh, I guess, Darren, maybe you can hit that first. Uh, yeah, probably a few people. As a as a teenager, uh, we we live a few hours away from Renmark up in the Riverland, and um, that was where Joe Brodel had his reptile park for for all those years. Um, so we used to regularly go there, and um, Joe was a really generous guy with his knowledge. He was always happy to talk. You know, I was probably a bit of an annoying kid to him at the time, but um, you know, I got a lot out of being up there and talking to him and, you know, we got to the point where he'd let me come around and help him feed snakes and stuff like that. So, you know, that, that was really good. Um, and my time up in Darwin when I lived there uh, became quite friendly with Graham Gow and, uh, you know, he only lived 40 minutes down the road in Humpty Doo and, and also spent a lot of time there with him. Um, he, and he was a real, really good mentor. Awesome. Okay. What about you, Daniel? Yeah, I guess for me, obviously, uh, obviously, Dad, um, pretty much initially when I was, you know, keeping carpets and blackheads, um, I would just always go to, to Dad and help him with questions and develop my knowledge from there. Um, and I guess when I started keeping green tree pythons, there's a few main guys um, that I look up to and, you know, consider a mentor. Um, Russell Grant, for one, um, Andrew Owen. Um, you know, James Lyon, um, I haven't really spoken to him much, but I, you know, I really watch closely what he's doing. 
And um, right. yeah, I just take a lot of time talking to those guys and, you know, really listening and taking it. What, what led you to go to Condros? Well, let me ask this question first. Like, what is, is Condros like one of those um, uh, harder to obtain species in Australia? Or is it, is it pretty common? Because uh, it, it seems like carpets are pretty common, right? Yeah, you, you can pretty much readily, you know, acquire yourself a green tree, tree python these days as long as you've got the right licensing. Um, I guess what led me down to the chondros, I remember when, you know, Dad initially had his, um, you know, back when I was younger, um, and those particular snakes really just, you know, imprinted in my mind. Initially, early on when I was keeping carpets and buckets, they just weren't really obtainable for me due to the pricing. Um, right. And yeah, when I did acquire my first pair, like that was it. I sort of moved everything on and that was my focus. And I just kept building up a group of the of chondros. When you had the carpets and the blackheads, was the chondro always the... The gold yeah. snake, the one. <laughs> yeah, when I was keeping those, the carpets and the blackheads, I was just always on YouTube, watching the green tree python videos, looking up stuff on the internet, just constantly, just always thinking how much I wanted them. And it was just always there. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you keep all the chondros, Daniel, and Darren, you keep the other stuff, or are you, do you have chondros too? Oh, I just just acquired a, a couple of uh, Cape York line range animals. Actually, <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. just little little babies. Uh, local guy here in Adelaide had a clutch, so yeah, couldn't resist. Awesome, awesome. So we just picked them up on Friday. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Congrats. That's awesome. <clears throat> Have you kept them before? Uh, yeah. Me. Yeah. Uh, not the not the Iron Range ones, no. So back yeah. back when I had back when I had greens, I got my first pair in two thousand and three, right. and um, they were extremely pricey in those days. And you you there wasn't we didn't have native weirdly enough we didn't have native animals available in the hobby. So these yeah. were in, international types, um, and yeah, we just went from there, raised them up and uh, managed to breed them in 2005. And uh, yeah, but yeah, the, the Iron Range ones didn't become available in the hobby until quite some time later. And uh, you know, an average green python in those days was around about seven, seven and a half K as a hatchling. And oh, wow. the, the, the natives were up around 10,000 each. So Holy it's, it's wow. yeah, yeah. Are there multiple yeah. localities in the hobby as far as what uh, the Australian chondros? Uh, we don't have as much um, locality types here in Australia as what you guys do in the States. Um, you know, we've obviously got the Australians. Um, there's a couple of guys working with some manic worries, the yellow form. Um, there's a few guys out there with some fewer BACs, um, but there's not really too many. Um, yeah i feel your pain because it's like you, you know when i when i look at you know australian keepers and their carpet pythons i get super jealous and <laughs> so yeah. you must be watching us with our beox and <laughs> yeah. aroos and yeah. quarries and all that yeah. kind of stuff definitely uh, okay so do you, are you guys more into, um, locality stuff or are you trying to get a specific phenotype or what, what's your, what's your goal? What's your breeding goals with them? Yeah. Like, um, I'm a fan of both the designer, the designer types that guys are doing, but I've also got a really big appreciation for any, um, locality type animals you can get your hands on over here as well. Um, yeah, I lo love the Australian, um, you know, the full white stripe. It's just with the green, it's beautiful. Um, it's the best one. There's yeah. nothing better. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Um, and the Kofi out types that I have, they're, they're beautiful as well. So I've got some real high hopes for those guys in the future. Um, and I'm, I'd love to get my hands on uh, the Russell Grant line, um, and it down the track as well. Wow. Um, yeah. 
Very cool. Okay. All right. So let's, uh, I guess let's talk about how you keep them. Like what is, uh, I, I'm, we're looking, I, I know the people that are listening can't see it, but I see a really very cool cage back there in the background with, uh, Condro just perch being a Condro. Um, <laughs> it's pretty cool. That's a nice setup. Um, yeah, I don't know. Let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I, guess, um, I like to keep them relatively simple, functional, um, you know, a couple of appropriate size perches. I, I use um, heat panel, um, just some normal day lighting. Um, yeah, I, I prefer to yeah, keep them, you know, quite simple. So it's, you know, easy to maintain, but I like to add, you know, a few visual things in there, like the universal rock backgrounds, um, some uh, silk, silk plants in there, just to, just so you can really really appreciate them like you spend a lot of money on these animals so you want to you know i like that in something and get that compliment yes right yeah i mean that's kind of the beauty of chondros and morelia they're out in the open and there for you to observe they're not going to hide in their you know their hide box or whatever and you know that's just perfect right there <laughs> look at yeah. that i mean that's so cool <laughs> very cool okay um, are you going to have this similar approach, Darren, with uh, how you're going to keep them? I mean, I know yours are just small now, but yeah, yeah, they're just they're just in a tub with the the plastic mesh for a perch, and yeah, you know, I keep them pretty basic on paper towel and so on. But oh, they will go into I will do naturalistic um, style enclosures for them when they're bigger, definitely for the same reason that Daniel said. You know, I don't I don't do any bioactive or anything like that. Uh, mine's all right. fake plants and. Uh, you know, carved foam and tile pointing and that sort of stuff. But it just, you know, some some could argue it's more for the kept, the keeper than the kept. But um, yep. I think it's just it just visually it looks great and it sets the animals off and it gives them more surface area that's usable in the enclosure. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, me and Rob talk about that a lot where, you know, you have a cage and if you don't have anything in the middle of it, you're you're losing all of this different area for the animal to go in. So if you stack, even if you stack some cork bark, well, obviously not for chondros, but, you know, for other reptiles, if you stack yeah. some cork bark, it's going to get so much more advantage out of that space. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What about so? What's 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 your guys' approach with temperatures and stuff like that? What what do you what do you shoot for as far as that goes? With keeping, um, up? I aim for roughly twenty nine to twenty five degrees. I think that's roughly eighty four, eighty five Fahrenheit, um, which I believe right. is pretty similar to what you guys in the states are keeping them at. So you're doing like uh um like an ambient no hot spot type of setup type of thing um yeah I, I don't do ambient controlled room temp I'll, I'll use a heat panel in each enclosure and um in control the thermostat and i'll set up to, to the design oh, okay yeah gotcha. okay very cool very cool okay uh all right and then I've, as I've far more as of a challenge more of a challenge here is you know we live in the driest state of the driest continent on earth and humidity, yeah, humidity is yes. a, is a is a big challenge. You know, so that's that takes a bit of bit of work. But yeah. So what do you do for that? How do you try to? Because chondros, I think they. I I don't know. I I seem to think that they require that humidity because that's sort of a struggle with here, where I'm at. It gets that dry heat in the winter time, like right now. It's freezing yeah. outside. And you got all this dry heat. Just sucks the humidity right out of your house. Um, how do you guys try to uh, offset that? Yeah, for me, I'll just give them a really good mist in the afternoon. Um, okay. I don't, you know, spray, right. I don't spray so it's, you know, really wet in there. I'll just spray the, the sides of, and the back of the cage and at the, you know, um, in the tub, just the back of the paper towel. I'll get that a little damp. And I'll, I even give the animals themselves a little direct spray. And that'll, that'll probably peak. Like at about ninety five percent humidity, and then the next, you know, the next morning, it, you know, it, it's cleared out, and it's dried out, and I'll give them a dry period during the day, and then come back across again and miss them in the afternoon the next day. Um, and that generally keeps them really well. 
Yeah, I think the cycle, I don't know what you guys think, but I think that cycle of humidity to where you're allowing it to dry out, yeah. uh, you know, really helps with them. And um, that's sort of the struggles. I, for some reason, I have had no luck with keeping chondros. I just struggle with them. I don't know why. I just, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Um, they'll be great for a while. And then all of a sudden they just sort of just go downhill. I don't know. Um I blame it on myself, <laughs> not them, but yeah, the winter is um, particularly hard here. I'll always get the odd bad shed through the winter, but um, yeah, outside of that, bad shed is really well. Yeah. Very cool, very cool. Okay, what about as far as um, feeding them? What do you what do you do as far as that goes? What's your approach? Um, with neos through to. Probably about two years, a little, little over two years. I'll, I'll right. feed them. I'll feed them weekly. Obviously, appropriate size meals, um, and I, I generally like to see them defecate after a couple of meals at least, and like to see some good activity between meals as well. Um, and then when they right. get to, you know around two and a half, I'll with the males, I'll, I'll give them a couple large mice every three weeks, um, and the females a couple large mice every fortnight um okay yeah and as long as i see some really good activity um in between i'll i'll just keep doing that very cool okay awesome uh you know do you how one of the things that uh we talk about here in the states is how big i guess a lot of people here keep their chondros uh, they they're feeding them jumbo rats and maybe not so much anymore, but you know, it used to be, you know, you're looking at a 2000 gram chondro. Uh, yeah, that seems crazy to me. <laughs> I don't know. Do you guys have that same thing in Australia I, or is, or I've you... seen it. I'm saying it. Yeah. I picked up this one particular male for a keeper in Sydney to send off for him. And this male, it was, 2.2 kilos. It was huge. I've never seen anything oh. like it. Uh, yeah, it was massive. Like, <laughs> it was massive, and the guy it was just like, like it was just always hungry. So you know, I just kept feeding it. <laughs> it was, yeah, yeah I, I think it's on a bit of a diet type of thing. Um, but yeah, but I, I mix it up sometimes as well. You know, I'll throw a um, wrap um, every few feeds. Right. Something a little bigger. Um, right. But yeah, I. Right. I think my biggest female was probably around around a kilo, I would say. Thousand grams. Right. Okay. You know, one of the things that um that I I was thinking about this is like so here in the States, for whatever reason, we sort of can breed chondros seems like year round. Uh, I mean yeah, somebody has bred you. a chondro at any point. Is that the same in Australia. I was thinking that maybe it would be different because you guys are actually where they're from. Well, maybe not, you know, where you guys are at, but like they're from there. So I would think that they would cycle with whatever is going on in in Australia. Is is am I wrong in thinking that way or yeah, I, I find um most keepers are having success, you know, during that June, July period is when most of the magic is happening for them. But I've seen some guys. So our, our winter. Yeah. Yeah. Our okay. winter. Sorry. Yeah. But um, I've seen some guys uh, see ovulation during late autumn. Um, and uh, I believe James Lyon, um, he's just had an ovulation. I, I think it was at the very beginning of December. So um, other wow. states, other states are varying a little. Um, in in SA, right. it's generally during that winter period. So do you, do you do you guys think it's from more from uh, you know temp is it temperature driven? Do you think that that triggers them or is it uh, pressure fronts or what? What's your thoughts? I think yeah. I think changes in pressure definitely count pressure, uh, especially yeah. at the right time of the year. If a storm come through, open up your windows and and uh, they they definitely tend to react to that. Um, but yeah, it's just it's too hard for us, particularly down here in South Australia. It's too hard for us to try and fight the climate 
to, to breathe them out yeah. of season. It's much easier to just go with the flow and and, and manage sure. your collection so that you, you, you're just following the natural rhythm. Not to say it can't I, be I think, done, but. Right. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's like a misconception that we have here or in the States is like Australia is just always hot. And, you know, down where you guys are at, it's probably close to what we have, right? I mean, you guys get cold temperatures and yeah, right? we get we get frost and ice on the cars. I and mean, right. where Daniel is, Daniel's at much higher elevation than, than where I am. I'm down on the plains, and Daniel's up in the Adelaide Hills. And yeah, okay. it, it gets absolutely freezing up there. Right, which blows my mind when it comes to so like diamond pythons and stuff. The temperatures that you know they're being exposed to is crazy but okay um so uh let's talk about maybe some of your collect i so i guess is honeycomb a kofi owl yeah she is she is <laughs> she's awesome I, I i was going through your collection and and looking at some of your snakes and that one just stood out to me there's something about yellow chondros i know everybody's after the you know the melanistic and the you know yeah. uh crazy mite phase uh one do they call my phase anymore i don't know that's like a bad term to use i guess but uh the yellow ones just wow man they just floor me uh tell us about that snake yeah she's um she's amazing um i remember it was 2018 i think it was, it was around christmas time and um I was sitting around the table and talking to dad about snakes as usual and i just i mentioned i was like if i could get any locality type i'd love to pick up like country gaps, like, that'd be amazing. <laughs> and then, right. And then he pulls his phone out. He's like, "Well, I've been talking to this guy, and and he's just had to talk to me." <laughs> I'm like, "You're kidding!" <laughs> I didn't believe it. It was yeah. It was it was very strange. So, um, sure enough, I got a um a hold of this guy, and I was like, I was really interested. And um, yeah, I he he hatched out six, and he kept one as a hold back. Um, and yeah, I brought them. Um, and at that, at that stage, I had, I had yearlings for a little while and I felt like I was going really well. Um, uh -huh. like this is probably something that n no particularly a new keeper should do, but, um, I, I acquired these five cut they were, they were about five weeks old and, um, I freighted them in, um, and they, they were about 10 grams. They were, they were tiny and I think they had one meal. So. I, I, and right. I thought to myself, you know, I'll be okay. I'll be able to get them established and, and all the rest. Um, but yeah, the, the next day, the day after I'd freighted them in, um, three of them had prolapsed and yeah, my, my heart just sank. <laughs> I was like, oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I had a local guy, you know, he, he helped me out a lot, we had a, you know, rectify it, but it just became a recurring issue with those three. And, um, slowly one by one they just they faded away essentially and the wow. two that I was left with were the only ones that they never had that issue they um they were good and luckily enough somehow i managed to have a male and a female but um oh man what are the chances yeah. of that <laughs> you know well that's that's why he bought all five i said to him look if you're going to get them get all five because you're going to increase your chances of having pairs yeah. in there and uh yeah I, I always love the uh, the chondro uh, selling approach, right? They're unsexed, so just you know, yep. buy a whole bunch of them, <laughs> you know, and like we don't know what they're going to turn out like, and so yeah. You know. yeah, particularly this guy was, um, you know, he was pretty keen to move them on, um, and he was he. I'd been chatting with him through the year, and by the time that he sort of successfully bred them and he contacted me, I'd already pulled the trigger on the Owen Pellies with Gavin, so. I, I oh, had no okay. fun, no funds left in my my piggy bank, so um, yeah, so I referred him to Daniel, and then and, and Daniel went for it. But yeah, it was very much like that. It's like you got to take all of them; they're this much. I've got all these other people ready to go if you don't want them. So it was a bit of a right. bit of a pressure situation, you know. Yeah. yeah. But, um, okay. On, so, on, oh, go ahead. On top of it, it was um, it was they were really difficult to establish and feeding. They were. I couldn't yeah. induce. I couldn't induce any strike. They were just runners, and I 
I tried right. all these. I was trying all these different techniques to chip down the brain, like teasing them. And um, I came right. across a video of a technique. It, it had been around for years, but for me, it was brand new. And it was just essentially, you know, cutting the pinky mouse head off, thawing that out, and just lodging it in their teeth. And they obviously couldn't spit it out, so they were forced to to swallow it. Right. And I did that maybe three or four times, and they just they just switched. They were they were off. They were just completely different. And from there, they just they just nice. powered through. Um. But yeah, but the the male male went through a change around about eighteen months. Um, got like a green wash, but he's got this real cool yellow undertone. I call that one um, gold mm -hmm. dust. But um, yeah, right. honeycomb, honeycomb's essentially like she's still pure yellow. She's got a few green freckles, um, and she's had them for probably the past twelve months now. So it looks like she's going to hold that color quite a while. So it's not, yeah, really excited. I the future of that i thing. had a i my uh, yeah i mean uh, that snake i i think too that snake reminds i had this biok that i got at the first carpet fest and at the time it had like two green scales on it and mm -hmm. you know it, it it go it went on to basically stay that basically a yellow snake with a couple green scales on it and yeah, awesome. um you know it 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 was an amazing snake, but I traded it for a carpet, <laughs> which is probably oh. bad. <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> Some people would question my judgment on that, but uh, <laughs> um, as long as I it really wasn't a hypo zebra Bradley caramel jag. No, 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 no. It was, it was a coastal, like a red. It was a red tiger. It was uh, the one I called Molly Ringwald, but. Uh, but I think that's why I, I don't know, man, that snake is gorgeous. So yeah. uh, your Facebook page is uh Condro boys, right? Is that, is that Condro boys. Like, right? Right. Oh, boss. Yeah. I said boys on, on Instagram um, and Facebook. Aren't you? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So if you go and look up honeycomb, you'll see what we're talking about. And uh, I mean, this snake is just gorgeous. It's just, and even, she's even got matching eyes. The eyes match the color as well. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Just amazing. Amazing sadly, snake. Sadly and breed, it's it's what's sorry, that? Um sadly the breeder lost the parents um in the in those bad oh, fires we had a couple of years ago. Um yeah, oh, man. which is really sad. So yeah. like, as far as I'm aware, I I think this is the only pair that's in Australia at the moment. Uh, oh shit, no pressure, man. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, um, uh, you know, with, I, I was going to say, oh, shit, I totally lost my train of thought. Oh, with the, with the feeding, um, if I find it interesting because that's the same struggle that we have with that locality in the U S I know Chuck Vogel is one that works with that locality specifically. Yeah. And yeah. he, he talks all the time about how difficult they are to get going. Yeah. Um, and that's what I found when I, was I wonder afraid. why. I'm not too sure. It's, yeah, everything that I read yeah. was that were notoriously hard to to establish, and that was my experience as well. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if maybe if I don't know maybe if we offered them lizards or something like that, they're skinks or maybe they would go frogs. I I don't know. I know people are iffy about doing that because of parasites and all, but. Well, yeah. what I did when I was establishing mine, uh, I had a few that were that were finicky, not many. Most of them fed right off the bat first go. But uh, what I did yeah. is I got some, we had lots of uh, geckos, like a common velvet gecko that we get already in our backyards. And you right. can get a couple, couple of those to drop their tail and then uh -huh. mash that tail up into like a paste. And then I put that on the nose of the pinky and that did the trick. Oh, okay. Mm. That's a that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh I've always thought that it's just a matter of you're just not giving them the right prey where they would eat, you know, but all these tricks we have, you know, to get them to go. Yeah. yeah I think a big part way. of it as well is getting getting some nutrition into them early to get their metabolism yeah. going. Um, right. it's it's almost like the ones that, that don't show any interest, it's almost like they don't know they have to eat. 
they're, they're you know, <laughs> but baby reptiles are very naive in that regard. So, right. Um, but it seems once you get a bit of nutrition into them and their, their digestion kicks in and, they, and they, their metabolism kicks in, that's when they seem to just turn on. So, which is worse, anteresia or chondros to get going? Uh, having done both, I'd say anteresia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there a specific species that's harder than the others? Uh, pygmy pythons. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've heard nightmares about that. I had one, but yeah. uh, it was uh, it, it same thing. It, it was eating, and then it stopped, and then crashed. You know. Yeah. 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 I, I bred mine two years in a row, and after two years of raising hatchlings, I had enough. I sold the whole group. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it probably would be okay if that was the only species you were keeping and you only had a few sure. and you could just concentrate on them, but yeah. yeah. So what about like as far as the popularity of chondros in Australia? Is that one of those snakes that everybody sort of it's yeah keen, it's, keen to it, add into the collection? It's really um, taken off these past couple of years. Um, I was just, I was, like, when I came into it, I was really fortunate that there just seemed to be a lot of chondros around that I could, you know, pick up. But now, like the the amount being produced each year, it's just not meeting demand. And you know, a lot of the guys that are producing these really cool designer type animals and whatnot, you know, they like to they like to hold on to them as well, just to see how they <laughs> yeah. go. Like, yeah. It becomes like a bit of a hoarding situation, and I can see myself doing that as well. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it seems to be they seem to be a really popular snake to to add to the group. Right. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's cool. So, what are, what are your thoughts on on have you have you bred yours yet? Um, this is this year will be my first year that I'll be aiming to successfully get get some through. Um, I did cycle um, a couple of pairs last year, but I think they just needed another year. So, I'm really um excited for the year ahead um I've got, so the australian i've got a, a pure australian pair ready to go uh, I know, a couple of designer types that i picked up from um simon stone um and that, that the male is you may know you may have seen it um, from one that i call snowflake with all the the really high white oh yeah so yes. i'm really excited yeah. for that pair that's a well. cool snake too yeah yeah uh cool so what's your approach to breeding? What, what, how do you approach it? Um, the, the approach I'm going to take is uh, leading into winter. I'll start to increase some mill frequencies with, with the females. Um, you know, instead of giving them a couple of prey items, I might give them one weekly just to increase it a little. And then as I get mm -hmm. toward um, winter, I'll just slowly bring down the temps and then I'll, I'll probably start introducing around June and then hopefully after first, some first initial locks, I'll see some faulty growth spark and then hopefully this year I'll see a couple of populations and it'd be nice to have a couple of doctors. Yeah. So do you have specific projects in mind? Like are you buying uh, are you, like uh... – I don't know. Or do you have like a specific animal picked out for another animal for a specific phenotype that you're you're sort of going after? You know, high white, yellow, this, that. Uh... Yeah, with with the snowflake um, pairing, I'd, I'd love to see if, if we can produce some more high white. Um, yeah, with with the red animals, I'd like to it'd be cool to see if you can you know, get some melanism in there. Um, but generally, the the locality types I have, like they're, they're for each other. That's it. Um, so yeah, I, I do I do like the, the designer type animals, and um, yeah, just see how they go and hold them back and think think cool and then yeah, in the future again. And... Yeah, I imagine that's the struggle, right? You hold them back, and then you get you know. <laughs> One that has all these different traits, and next thing you know, yeah. you have this huge collection of chondros. <laughs> you know, oh man, that's that's cool. So, is there a particular animal that 
Like, what do you think of something like the sickness? Do you know about the sickness that we have? Oh, yeah, we all know about the sickness. (laughs) (laughs) There's a lot of cool Uh, chondros in the States. We look at brains like white diamonds, um, the the sickness, um, blue moon that Gary has, House of Blues. Um, It's just a whole, those are names. They just take like a whole new identity on that snake. And like you can start, yes. you can start um, racking up reader code names, but then you know, as soon as you say a name like the sickness, you're like, oh, man, that is mental. And then you just, <laughs> you just start going yeah. down this rabbit hole of all these cool chondros, you know? Yeah. Mr. Blue and you know, all that kind of stuff is, uh, it's, it's. I remember Greg Maxwell's I, I, lemon, I, lemon tree. <laughs> Yep. Uh, yeah. yeah. See, I, I, you know, it's interesting because you guys have a different dynamic than what we have in the states, to where you can't import animals, so you're not dealing with the imports like some of the chondro breeders here in the states are, right? So it's always been like this competition to where the person that's getting new, getting into chondros, um, they sort of will look at, they'll go to a reptile show and they'll see the. Three hundred dollar import, and they'll mm-hmm. be, they'll go with that rather than the say five hundred dollar uh, captive born and bred, and they don't realize, uh, you know what comes with that import, and establishing yeah. that import and vet bills and all these things that the quarantine yeah. time and all these things that go with it, and um, but you guys don't have that, so wow, that's nice. <laughs> We're you know. So everything is captive born and bred. So do you have, I guess that just changes the, the, the whole dynamic of the market, right? I mean, everybody's, no. do you have like entry level chondros that, that, that are made for people that are, are new to come into chondros? Not really. Yeah. No. No. I guess like no. You disagree? The, Australian, the Australian types are probably, you know, the better ones to start off with, I would say. Yeah, there's oh, so certainly be... there's certainly the cheapest, but no uh, right. no any of five hundred dollars. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, yeah, that's what I mean. So that's how it changes the whole dynamic of the market that you guys are are working mm. with. Wow, that's interesting. That's cool. Yeah, and and they're bitching about five hundred dollars. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm I mean... sure you would. <laughs> Pull out the credit yeah. card if uh it's like as far as I'm aware, yeah. like the BAC types are probably the most common you guys have over there to talk about. But like for us here, if you were to pick up a BAC animal, you're you're spending thousands, thousands. Yes, I mean, wow. but wow. Yeah. I think BIOX probably now maybe maybe I would say between six and eight hundred dollars is probably where they go. You know? We'd probably be looking at probably. Five, I mean, the Bioc that I, wow. Oh, wow. The Bioc that I had that was all yellow, I think I got her for uh, $250. Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah, 250 <laughs> bucks. I would have bought 20 of them. I'll send you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, man, that's that's crazy. So do you plan on doing, you know, like is, uh, is it, well, let me ask this question. So when do you guys do reptile shows, go to reptile shows? Um, and if you do, when you go, is that an animal that somebody's coming to a show and go to buy? Cause I found that when I was doing like high end carpets, they're not really like, you may have some people that are coming, but usually those sales are already done before the show. So they're just coming to pick it up as opposed to somebody that's sort of just like looking to get their first reptile and coming over and uh, picking up a green tree. Is, is that something that you guys experience or are people throwing that money down uh, for their first snake? I've only ever been to the small show, but data probably have a bit more input on that. Yeah, we'd we we'd had uh, a small reptile expo here a few years ago in Adelaide, but it was very small, and it, it's never we, they've never got it off the ground again. But I've been to some of the New South Wales ones, and I went to the okay. last one was the Penrith one in I think it was twenty twenty, just before 
COVID hits was February 2020. Okay. Um, so it's 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 pretty hard unless you live in that state to be able to go and vend at a show because for us that means ah. we have to freight all our animals over and all that sort of stuff. That would be a huge amount of stress. So, um, and, and conversely, if we buy something from the show, then we've got to leave it there and have it freighted the following week or whatever. So I think you're right. right. I think animals like that. Those those deals are sort of pre done. You know, most most animals are sold. They're on a waiting list or uh, and that sort of stuff. Yeah, I don't think you'd see you'd, you'd see animals on display, but probably mm-hmm. not for yeah. sale. Right. <laughs> They're always the animals that you want, though, right? The ones that are <laughs> on display. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I always forget that you guys have uh, you have a different setup to where you have different states and yeah. You, yeah, different rules apply at different states or whatever. Yeah, we've got to apply for import and export permits in and out of the state. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Okay. Um, yeah, what other, what other, what other, uh, what are some of your other highlights of your collection, your favorites? Um, that, that particular um, Australian female that, um, is, is what definitely one of my favorites with that full white stripe. It's just stunning. Um, yes. Yeah. The, co- the co- That's yeah, the one behind you, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. She's just in the top here. Um, and I've got um, a red animal from um, a breeder, Darren Ford, and she's she's amazing. She's got you know, a lot of black flecks and blues and some yellows. Green. She's got she's got a lot going on. Some. Pretty excited to see what um, yeah what she can produce there. Um, I've got a yellow sibling to that that red animal, and that that snake has turned out really cool. Like yellow blotches, blue dorsal patterns. Um, I mean, I, I don't discount the yellow form either. I'm I'm a big fan of the red and yellow. Um, right. But the, the reds are obviously you know really popular because they tend to go through that real explosive OTC. Um, and you can tend to get some more funky right. end results, but um, I, I love the yellow form as well. Yeah, it, well, here not a lot of people like. Well, I shouldn't say not a lot of people like, but it's definitely the red is more favored. Uh, yeah. Than the than the yellow. Yeah, I guess. I guess I like to be the oddball. <laughs> I yeah. like the yellow. <laughs> yeah, when you see those real those animals with high millimeters and. Those real cool blue lines. They tend to all come from yeah. red neos, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know what I find? Uh, I think my favorite thing about chondros is that um, you see them in a cage is one thing. You take them out into the sun, and then all of a sudden their colors just like oh, yeah. just become this whole new palette of, of, of color. And you see all these little details that, you know, you don't see um, – necessarily if they're in the cage and man when i was looking at well it was the sickness <laughs> when i was looking at him in the sun holy shit yeah. that snake was nice oh, you, you saw that in person yeah yeah oh yeah. wow wow awesome. yeah I've yeah bill that. has uh he has uh, an amazing collection of crazy contrasts <laughs> it's just crazy oh. sorry if, go I, ahead. Had, Got if you. I had a visit to texas i'd love to I'd love to meet Bill. He's got some amazing animals. Like oh, there's a lot of Texan keepers that have just got some crazy stuff. Like just insane. Um, yeah, it's weird. I I don't know how you you know how it is for you guys, but we have like these pockets around around the states to where you know it used to be Maryland used to be where there was a this hub of chondro you know like Trooper Walsh and mm-hmm. all those Buddy Buscemi's up there, all those guys. Um, and then there's this like pocket in Texas to where there's just like these hardcore chondro people uh they uh they took over the carpet fest and made it chondro fest because <laughs> there's so many chondro people yeah. Uh, but yeah all good stuff um okay yeah, do you do you ever get into uh the to carpondros or anything like that are you are you strictly yeah it's, it's, not, it's not really my thing i think green tree pythons they're right. just they're just like the pinnacle for me. Like they just look amazing as they are. I don't know. For me, yeah. Why do you have really to do anything to? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if that's what you want to do, like nothing against it, but just for me, I just it doesn't do anything for me. I guess. 
Yeah. Yeah, I never got into those. I don't I don't know. I mean, I've 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 been into some, you know, crazy carpet combinations and stuff, but never got into the carpondros. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's, no, we we both agree with Gary Shavino on that regard. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. I love his little comments about that's great. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Gary's a good guy too. Yeah, um, yeah. he's got some amazing chondros as well. Yeah, exactly. for sure. <laughs> I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna shift gears for a second, and I want to talk about some Owen Pellies. Uh, you know, I don't know. I've never talked to anybody that's kept them, um, at least on the show. I don't know. I, I what can you tell me about them? What do they like to keep? Uh, how it is to have them? Is it one of those things where you're like, wow, I can't believe that this is in my house? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, I, I, you know, probably the first year I had them every morning, I'd stand in front of the cage and just pinch myself. <laughs> um, you know, it's just one of those snakes. I, I guess a bit like rough scales back in the day, are snakes that we never, ever dreamt we'd ever be able to own. And um, yeah. Just you know, talking to Gavin about them, and then I guess the hardest part was getting getting my other half across the line on on buying them. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, they're they're incredible snakes. They're very very different to anything I've ever kept, and yeah, I'm sure you'll hear other people say that uh, when when they get them into captivity as well. They're probably partly due to the fact that they're F1 captive bred, so they're still they still have a lot of those. Um, I think the terms epigenetics of, of, of the wild traits. So they're, they're right. quite, they're not aggressive in any way, they're, but they're quite shy and sensitive. They, they don't like being handled. They don't seem to, you know, when you get them in your hands, they just continually move. They never settle. You know, you can yeah. walk around with an olive python or a carpet python over your shoulders while you're cleaning his cage or whatever. They're not that snake. Um, right. Very sensitive to change. Uh, when I when I built the the adult enclosures, when I first got them, uh, so mine are twenty. The males are twenty seventeen, and the females are twenty eighteen. And okay. um, I just had them in basic four four by two by two enclosures. I put a shelf across the the back so they could get up high, and that's where I put their hide box. Um, kept them pretty basic. Um, they outgrew those in pretty much twelve months. Uh, they wow. were in 12 months they were two two and a half meters um, wow. and okay. certainly not you know that's the other thing too that they grow their rate of growth as a proportion of food they take in is amazing as well compared to a carpet python or an olive python um, but obviously they're not there's no bulk to them they're not a bulky snake so you know, you you'd sort of you would you'd see them go into the hide, and you just think, how the hell did all that length fit into that hide? You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, but yeah, they're 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 great captives as long as you, yeah, you adapt your keeping style to the snake. Um, right. I think if you were the type of keeper that, you know, there's some keepers who. They make their snakes live on their terms, so they get them out right. all the time and all that sort of stuff. If you were to do that with an Owen Pelly python, it would probably stop eating and go downhill really quick. Gotcha. Um, so they're – but the, the beauty of the way I've got the, the adult enclosures set up is they've got that elevated rock hide, which I can access from the outside. I really never have to touch the animal because I can clean the whole cage and service it while they're in their hide when they come out. I open that hatch and check in there, make sure that's all clean. But it's pretty rare. I really need to get them out. Right. And I just find they settle so much better like that. Right. When I moved them from the four-foot cages into the adult cages, the male continually prowled the cage for probably two weeks, almost nonstop, oh, wow. day and night, just really? with the stress of moving him into that cage. Yep. Yeah, took him probably a, a probably a good three weeks before he actually learned where everything was and started using the hide box and behaving normally again. Wow. So do you you keep them together, right? No, no, they're, they're in their own, own separate. Oh no, cages. separate. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Gotcha. That was a huge task building those two cages at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did an awesome but, job, man. I mean, that was, I remember you sharing it in the chat. It was, uh, yeah, yeah. It probably took me about four months, I reckon, to get them finished. <laughs> yeah, I feel like taking up my garage. Nice. I had to park my car outside. <laughs> 
uh, so ha- Daniel, how do you like the Owen Pellies? Is that uh, something that uh, yeah, they're really catches cool. your eye when you go up? I wouldn't mind having one as a display animal myself. Um, right. Down the front. Um, yeah, they're really cool. And it's like, yeah, like Dad was saying, like when you're handling them, they just don't sit still. Like they're just constantly on the move. I just, yeah, they're awesome. Their eyes, I love their eyes. Um, they're a cool snake. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that when we were with Gavin, he was showing us some of his captive born and breds, and they just, yeah, you're right. They just kind of constantly, it was hard to take a picture with, with yeah. them because they were just constantly, you know, moving around. Yeah. But uh, how are they as far as like feeding and, and you know? Yeah, feeding, uh, they still much prefer birds, uh, even, birds, even at okay. this size. So they're, they're probably both around the three to three and a half meters. Um, Okay. And uh, they, yeah, if that's what they want they want to eat, that's what I'll feed them. Yeah, they will they've taken the odd rat, but right. um they definitely prefer quail. Um that's what they're on at the moment. So they they'll have um the biggest quail I can get are around about the three hundred grams. So they'll have one of those and that'll still leave a fair bulge. Um right. like one of those a fortnight. Uh, but they're just in at the moment, they're in real feeding mode. They just seem to want to eat all the time, which is a good thing because the males are around about end of March, early April, sort of begin, you know, in sync with the dry season, the onset of the dry season up in Darwin. They just stop eating altogether, no interest, um, okay. and, and probably won't eat for five months. So wow. it's it's good to uh, to get that food into them while while they're in food food mode. Yeah. The- I mean, the one we saw in the wild, I'm not sure if it was feet. I must, I'm just assuming that that's what it was doing, but um, it was basically there were, it was just up on this tree all the way up, just bats flying all around it. And, yeah. You, you were up there, yeah. it was around October. Yeah. So that's sort of the beginning of yeah. the build up. Yeah. So yeah, it, yeah. that pr- was probably having it, trying to get its first feeds for that part of the year. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, that was an experience for sure, but uh, <laughs> to be able to stare at them in your snake room would would be even cooler. But you know, all right, baby steps. <laughs> um, uh, okay, what else? I mean, I don't know. What else are they? Do they do they shed weird? Is there anything weird? Or are, are they? No, no, like, they do no? perfect, perfect one piece sheds most of the time. Um, you know, I will increase the humidity in the enclosure. Because again, you know, down here it's very dry, um, whereas up in Darwin, it's particularly at, at this time of the year, you're mostly sitting around seventy to eighty percent humidity. Um, right. So I will, I will spray the cage down and 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 keep the nest box a bit more humid when I know that they're opaque, and and that's that's really all I have to do. That perfect one piece shed. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Do they come out at night? Or are they more? You see them out throughout the. At certain times um, of the day, or they'll generally come out. So the way I've got the lights set up, I've got them all on that grid connect sort of stuff. So I've got a, a light that comes on in the morning, and it's sort of that color temperature of dawn um, that comes sure. on about six thirty, something like that. And then uh, a daylight one comes on, and then I've got uh, full spectrum and UVB tubes above. They come on around okay. about ten thirty, and they're on throughout the main part of the day, and they go off around about three three thirty. And I find they'll generally come out for a basket around about twelve forty one o'clock. They'll come out, bask for a couple of hours, then go back into their hide. But in that dusk period, uh, as the lights right. are going off, they'll they'll sit there with their head out of the poking out of the hide. And then, and and then they'll 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 emerge once the lights are off. Then they'll emerge and start start climbing around. Wow, that's cool. That's almost exactly how it happened uh, when we saw it. It was basically dusk and it, the sun had just gone down and yep, yep. just in the right spot at the right time. But uh, that's cool. Um, any other odd behaviors about them or interesting or anything else that they do? Uh, that's they change color. Have you seen that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they don't do it every night, which is interesting. Um, huh? So, really? so I don't, I don't notice it every night. But yeah, some sometimes I'll come down, you know, after lights out and they're out and around. I'll sort of shine a torch on whatever, and they've got that shimmery silver 
Uh, and and also uh, when I had them in the previous enclosures, I used to take them outside and put them in a, I don't know what you call it, it's like a, a puppy playpen. It's like a mesh pop-up thing that you put puppies in to yeah. keep them under control. Yeah. So sure. I'd put one of those outside just to let them get some natural sunlight. And uh, I found putting them out in the natural sunlight often made them go really light as well and accentuate the, the dark blotches. Hmm. But um, wow, that's yeah, so that's that's a little bit different. Okay, is there but one of the things? A, yeah, go ahead. I'll, I guess one of the things, you know, getting them in, you know, like I mean, I've kept lots of different species of python, so I, I, I was sort of confident there. But yeah, you know, having there's no there's no rule book. I mean, I'm lucky. I'm, I'm good friends with Gavin, and I can pick up the phone any time. Yeah. And I, and, I, and I did quite a few times in those first couple of months. <laughs> but um, yeah. you know. Not having any rule book to, you know, just having to learn as you go. And, and that's why I think, you know, it's important. You've got to let the snake be the snake and don't right. impose yourself on it too much. And then, you know, and then Gavin certainly agreed with that. I know he's had problems with some other people that have bought them and they've sort of made them fit into their life and they've had issues and, you know, with feeding right. and all that sort of thing. Um, it's really, it was really a hands off approach, but just, yeah, nervous, I guess, a degree of nervousness, you know, so you're learning as you go. I guess so. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. When you make uh you make that big investment on a snake and you know <laughs> they yeah. don't eat, you're like, ah yeah. <laughs> so you go to do that with chondros too, right? <laughs> you know, for sure. Oh, okay. Um, and temperatures just I don't know if you said that or not, but the temperatures, you're just sort of giving them a basking spot as far as a, a light type of thing? Yeah, so uh, I use a, a deep heat projector in a, in a large okay. dome. So it's a 100-watt it's deep heat projector, and it's on. they're running on the microclimate Evo light thermostat, so I've got four different temperature periods throughout the 24-hour cycle. And but mainly during the day, I've got I've got it set at thirty one and a half. But in in the top of that uh, hide, there's actually a thick piece of slate, similar to what Matt Somerville did with his enclosure, and that that uh-huh. retains a lot of heat as well. Uh, so right underneath that, it's around about thirty four, thirty four and a half. Uh, they'll mm-hmm. generally only bask right under that, sort of with a couple of days after a feed. Um, but okay. otherwise, they're just they're just in that general area, um, they're, so they're sort of keeping themselves. So you check them with a heat gun. They seem to keep themselves around about the 31 degrees. Um, okay. And then the, the thermal gradient is vertical in those enclosures because they're 2.1 metres tall. So, um, you know, the male particularly, some nights he'll just come out and he'll go down and just coil up on the floor, you know, and just sit there. You know, maybe that's another ambush strategy, I'm not sure, but uh, the female right. doesn't do it, but the male does. Wow. Hmm. It must be cool too to keep a species that not many people have worked with. So to your point of what you're saying, this let the snake be the snake. But yeah, going through that process of learning about something that's not really known, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I take lots of fun. notes on activity cycles and all that sort of stuff. I make notes and things like that. That's just something that I do. But um, yeah, it's 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 interesting for sure. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. And uh, I believe Gavin is working on a book on them, right? Yeah, so, he is. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's too far away, it. actually. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I can't wait to read that. Um, okay. I so you're talking about different lights at 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 uh, different times. That that was kind of interesting. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. You're just having like different. Is it different spectrum bulbs or is it different? Uh, so there's two There's two um, the LED downlights, but you can set the color temperature on them. So I've got one that's ah, set okay. at the cooler, more yellow sort of light that comes on in the morning and then it goes off when the daylight ones come on and then it comes back on in the afternoon uh, as it gets towards dusk, just trying to okay. loosely replicate a normal light cycle instead right. of going from dark to bang, full on, you know, full spectrum, <laughs> right. UVB, you know. Um, right. Yeah, that's all That's all I was attempting to do with that. And they're just on timer schedules, which you can control on an app on your phone. And I just, you know, I'll just adjust it each week to whatever the normal sunrise and sunset time is here. I was telling Owen, the other, we did a show the other night, and I was telling him about these, um, I stumbled upon on Amazon, they have these like smart plugs. 
And mm -hmm. what you can do is you can go into the shortcuts app on an iPhone and you can a a set it to go on and off at sunrise and sunset. So you don't even have to adjust times or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm cool. sort of new to this reptile technology. So like the idea of not having to go and turn off all these bulbs or, you know, makes, uh, makes life great. I don't, I don't know if you guys have that, but holy shit, that's nice. Yeah, we do, but I don't think so. Yeah, the stuff you can get now. No, we don't have the option to set them to come on at dusk and up and off at night. Um, we generally have to set that those times ourselves, but it'd be awesome if we could get right. a product. Like you're saying over here, that'd be great. Yeah. So this is, I stumbled upon this through the iPhone, right? So I think that, that a lot of people are using the apps for the actual, like if you had a smart plug or a smart bulb or something like that, they're using the app for that bulb. But if you go in, if you have an iPhone, if you go into the shortcuts thing, you can sort of, I think it's, you go under the automation tab. When you go on the under automation tab, I guess because the phone knows from the weather or wh wherever it's pulling that information, but it knows sunrise and sunset uh, from from whatever it's pulling it from and in your area, and it will it turns off and oh, it's the greatest thing. I just I just like it's been two weeks that it's been it's the greatest. It's click lights off. You don't have to worry about like daylights. Well, you guys you don't have daylight savings time like we do, but yeah, we um, do. Yep. Oh, you do? Oh, yep. okay. We're in it now, actually. Oh, okay. So it doesn't um, get dark but, here uh, at the moment until about nine o'clock at night. Okay. Yeah, that was the one thing I did notice when we were there, how early it, but I guess it's because it was the opposite, because we've always been there in like October, November time. So that's going into your, that would be spring, right? Coming into, yeah, spring, yep. Right. Okay. Very cool. Um, yeah, reptile technology uh, is, uh, I don't know, is, uh, it's, it's, I'm, I'm curious to see where it goes in the next 10 years as far as us, utilizing some of that, uh, that stuff. Um, oh, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. We, we were talking about it on the, uh, the AHP podcast about you know back right. in the day we we had we had party globes that's what we used yeah blue blue yeah. or red party globes you know on a, yeah. on a on a wall thermostat that was designed for a air conditioner for your room that you had to rewire and rejig and yeah <laughs> it's it's great what you can get now somehow we made it work you know mm. <laughs> well okay cool um I don't know. You want to talk about some anteresia? Uh, what's, sure. What do you have going on with anteresia? Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, mainly focusing on uh, the marble gene and T positive gene in in the, in the children's pythons. That's probably my main thing. Uh, I, I did have some Simpsons pythons as well, but since moving a lot of the snakes into this little bedroom here, I've realised that right. in winter I probably won't be able to get it cool enough in here to to breed right. Simpsons. So I, so I let all those go. And uh, yeah, just focusing on the, the children's problems, really. Um, so maybe you could talk to. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, you go ahead. I was going to say to, to talk a little bit about the marble gene. Um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, you know, how does it work? I, I, I remember when we talked about it a long time ago, it was sort of just coming into mainstream. Um, yeah. What have, what's, what is it, what has been learned since? Uh, say five six years ago. Um, well, I guess originally I think there was an animal. I'm not sure if it was a wild animal or if somebody had bred it, but it, it was up in the Northern Territory. And it was up in uh -huh. Darwin, and that snake ended up uh, with Simon Stone when he was right in the. He had his Southern Cross Reptiles business. Um, right. Simon worked with them for around about five years, I think. He he produced heads and and did that outcrossing and proved that it was a recessive trait. Um, around about 2012, I reckon it was, his wife, Diane, got really sick and uh, they wound up the business and actually sold the whole group uh, via an auction. They had an auction and um, a lady in North Queensland bought the whole group and, and sort of took it over from there. Um, 
it's it's a really hard gene to work. Best I can see is there's something that is um, well, it's, it's working in two ways because you you know you look at a baby marble and then you look at that same snake two years down the track. They're completely different. So there's a time over there's a progression over time. Uh, that the melanin comes in, but it disrupts where the melanin is and it also disrupts the production of the melanin. In, in, and it seems to do it differently for every snake. Like, the, you know, if you look at them on a, on a on, like I'll, I'll look at my babies under a magnified uh, mirror and uh, it's lit with LEDs so you can really see all the scales and everything. And there, there's no two are alike. They're like fingerprints. You know, right. it's, it's it's really interesting. In one huh. clutch, you will have variation in base color. You'll have variation in the distribution of the melanin and, and the pigment. It's yeah, it's crazy. That's and now I've got these these hmm. ones that are producing the white stripes down them, and that the white's coming right high up the sides as well. So I'm sort mm-hmm. of focusing on on developing that line. Um, I let a couple of babies go from last year, but I've I've got all the clutch for this year. And uh, and yeah, it's 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 been reproduced, so it wasn't just a, an aberrant thing. Um, hmm. But yeah, so that's that's what I'm focusing on with the Antaresia. That's cool. Yeah, they. I remember when the uh, Complete Children's came out, and that I guess it was really the first time that I saw that gene. I was like, "What the hell is this? <laughs> Holy shit! Yeah. It's a really yeah. beautiful snake." Um, do you think that yeah. it's it's a recessive gene? And it's being selectively bred, or do you think that there's other genes that you could pull out from what I you're think, saying with the stripe and the white size? Yeah, I think most of the, the breeding we've seen to date has been, um, you know, there's, I guess there's been people that have just wanted to get into that gene and have just wanted to reproduce mm-hmm. marbles. And then there's been other people, um, you know, people like Peter Birch and Marty Bahaja and over in Melbourne that have that have really been focusing on that and they're, they're years ahead of me and uh, I'm not trying to produce anything that they've already produced. That's why I thought, you know, when I saw something different in these animals, I thought I'd keep that and, right. and develop that yeah. because that's, I guess, a, a point of difference uh, from some right. of the other marbles around and rather than just sell them all off and lose control of it, I'll uh, keep them together and see what I can do with it. Try, I'm trying, I'm going to try and increase the amount of white. Okay. I've already got some that, you know, if you were to look at them, you'd say, oh, that's a pied. But, you know, you can't call it pied. <laughs> it's, that's, <laughs> that's what I mean. It's it's a really weird gene. Huh. That's cool. All right. Um, okay. And so, and then you're working with the, you said T plus? Yep. Yeah. So, I've, yep. So I've got some, uh, some just straight T positive children's, and I've got some T positive children's that are also het for marble. So, so they'll they'll produce um, T positive marbles out of those, and I've got a, a pair of double visual T positive marbles as well that are ready to go this season. Now they're three years old, so oh, I'll wow. be pairing them this season. So that'll be the first time I've been able to produce a full clutch of T positive marble visuals. So yeah, okay. that'll be that'll be really good. I'm looking forward to doing that pairing. Is that what's called the tarble? The tarble, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I thought that was it. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So, okay, so this 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 season you might have a full clutch of of them tarbles. Double right? double visuals, yeah. Tarbles, wow. yeah. Very cool. And I don't know if I've ever seen one of them, to be honest with you. I mean, I'm like where I really look it up. Wow. So you're trying to take that white up higher onto the sides, basically. Uh no, this this is this is just the tar. Oh, that's a tar. So that's a tar. Oh, okay. That's the female. Yeah. So you know, you can see there's sort of a yellowy cream overtone. I'm gonna let it touch the phone because I think that's what happened before. <clears throat> Very cool. Wow. Yeah, that's a cool snake. Yeah, so basically, um, I guess for people that can't see this and are in, you know, in the states, I would say it kind of looks like um, the sugar ball python, to where the side, the the bottom uh, quarter of the snake is sort of white and has this sort of yellow wash over the top of it. And, yeah. yeah, that's the belly is is white, solid yeah. white. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Beautiful snake, very cool. I feel like the ants are the bull python of Australia. 
I can see why they're popular. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever get uh, wanting to see, uh, to work with ball pythons? Have that ever? Uh... Oh, wow. So this is the one that's sort of what you're saying could be pied looking, I guess. So this is one of the 2020 marbles. Wow. You can see what I mean by yeah. pied. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That, that is crazy. You can't, can't call it pied though. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> well, you know, we've got to work out what it is and yeah, go from there. Wow. That is a cool snake. So they're pretty straightforward to breed, right? I yeah. Mean, do you do yeah. anything special for them? I mean, no, not really. Breed, no follow, matter what. Yeah, just follow the normal, you know, winter cooling regime. Um, let they turn all their heat off at night time. Still give them the access to thirty-two degrees during the day. Um, just right. yeah, pretty pretty standard breeding standard pattern for those stuff. guys. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, I've got those, and um, I've got I've got a couple of white lip pythons as well. I just did just put them into their adult enclosures, but they're only yearlings, so that they're sort of. But even at yearlings, they're they're probably close to four foot total length already. <laughs> Crazy! Wow, yeah. How do you like them? How do you like? Oh, they're great. Them? Oh, they're great. They're, they're <laughs> you know they're um yeah you know, again they're not they're not play with me snakes. You know what I mean? They're, no. <laughs> um, yeah, but. Um, but no, they're great. I, they were just the side of them curled up on their rock shelf underneath the light. Just the the, um, the refraction of the light from them is amazing. Yeah, yeah, and nice snakes. Yeah, I had um, I had a pair of them. I I gave them the Owen um, just because uh, I don't know for whatever reason they're another one that it, I think it's probably to your point right that you were making earlier about the snake, you know, trying to. Uh, make the snake the way you want it to be rather yep. than let the snake be the snake, you know? Yep. Yep. So my approach was pythons are all like carpets and I just kept them all like that. Whereas they're a little more sensitive to humidity and, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, they're quite thin skinned and they, they do need a yes. decent amount of humidity, especially yeah. with shedding or you'll have shedding issues. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. White lip pythons. Yeah. That's, uh, that's right up Owen's alley. He's he. It's been his. Uh, he's been trying to breed them for I don't know. Seems like six years. I think. Mm. <laughs> Keeps striking out. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what it is about them, but uh, he just seems to. I know some of it is sometimes he gets. He'll have a male, then he loses the female, then he has the pair, then it you know it turns out to be two males or yeah. whatever. It yeah. Would be. Yeah. But, you know, so. It's just that dreaded when you see that combat happening like you were saying <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i just wasted four years no <laughs> <laughs> very cool okay so uh <clears throat> and what else what else do you do you well, let me ask this question do you guys work with any carpets at all have you at all ever Oh, I have. I used to be big into jungle carpets. I used to breed a lot of those back okay. in the early 2000s. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, was but, it localities that you were after or specific uh, phenotype? No, it was more phenotypes. It's Again, I, I got phenotype. a couple from Simon Stone. He had a, a, a very good bloodline, which I think the founder animals were like Tully, Tully Gorge animals, but – um, yeah, okay. he'd, he'd done some some refining with them. And um, in those days, it was all about trying to intensify the, the gold or the yellow. Uh, and, yeah. and so, yeah, that, but I sold all of those when I, when I got the chondros. So. Gotcha. I've got, I've got yeah, a couple of um, uh, rainforest diamonds, sort of the Central Coast New South Wales diamonds. Um, so they're, only, they're only a what, yearling at the moment. Are they considered the, I guess, the intergrade zone? Diamonds? No, not that, that far up. No, they're... not not Port Macquarie. Oh. That's, that's, no, these are more like the ones that you would get around Central Coast or around um, uh, Gosford sort of area. Um, yeah, that's sort of central New South Wales coast uh, where they've got the pockets of uh, temperate rainforest. Gotcha. Okay. Huh. I, I don't know why I thought that they were that. That's good to know. Um, very cool. Are they any different than 
just as far as the way they look is different um, than diamond yeah, they, or yeah they, they've sort of got more of a more of an exploded pattern and and, and quite high yellow they've in the last few months they've just the yellows really started to Accentuate. I mean, as you know, baby, baby diamond pythons are pretty dull and boring looking, and yeah, but uh, you know, when they, are. <laughs> yeah, but when they when they hit that year or so, they really yeah start to pop. So yeah, they're looking really nice. Oh wow! Okay, cool. Now I've got a pair of old pythons. So have an old albino, pythons. Yeah, an al- big albino female and a, and a het male. So I'll be pairing them this season as well. So that'll be good to okay. see if anything happens. Very cool. Very cool. What about you, Daniel? Is there uh, any pythons that you have besides chondros or want to add besides chondros? Um, and Owen Pelly's? <laughs> I went and had a visit at um, Steve Crawford's place probably a couple of months ago, and um, he had a couple of grub pythons, and oh, they, were, they were just so cool. Um, I, I love a scrub python. Yeah. Yeah, they uh, they're 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 a handful, but yeah, they are yeah. cool snakes. I have uh, I guess it would be a Meraki Southern, you know, uh, female, which is uh, pretty cool. Um, but I would love to. Uh, there's something about the pattern of King Horn Eye. Sorry, Scott, I'm not saying King Horn. Eye. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um. But yeah, I don't know. There's something about that pattern. That's uh but they they are they can be big impressive animals. Holy yeah. shit. But yeah, I'm okay. pretty happy with just, you know, keeping a nice group of chondros. I, I wouldn't mind a small group of Antaresia, some marbles, um as well. Maybe paratibles. Um but yeah, just, I, I don't think I'll I don't think I'll venture too much outside of the chondros. Yeah. Yeah, they kind of they seem to do it for you. They seem to be the you know you're you're with chondros like I am with carpets. It's yeah. it's kind of hard to branch outside of mm. <laughs> you yeah. do it, but you know. Yeah, it's good. It's good to have a bit of diversity. Um, but you know, if at the end of the day, if it doesn't float your boat, standing there looking at it in the cage, then there's no point keeping yeah. it. I guess yeah, you know, everyone's different. Point. Yeah. So uh, maybe we can talk a little about uh, herping uh you guys have done um i guess my question is going to be have well my first question i'm assuming you guys have herp together um what's your greatest find um we haven't done a lot together i mean when when daniel was younger we did a trip up to new south wales and we did some herping in the wadigan mountains there um found some diamonds and some stevens banded snakes and things like that most of most of the herping i've done has been up when I lived up in Darwin, you know, you know, okay. I would, you know, me and Gavin would go out at least once a week. We sometimes we drive all the way out to uh, Jabiru and back. You know, just mainly oh, road wow. cruising, not not right. um, too much hardcore rock climbing and stuff like that. But um, right. yeah, we'd got to the point where you know we knew that had like that Arnhem Highway dissects quite a few different types of habitat. Um, you've got the yeah. you've got the the floodplain area. You've got fog dam. You've got dry scrub. So you can actually cover a lot of ground, you know, ecologically speaking and species wise by by road cruising and by driving along that road. Um, yeah. So we used, we used to do a lot of lot of that. Um, in fact, it's funny you talk about um, Darwin carpets. I, I got up to Darwin. I was in the Air Force and I got posted up there. I didn't know Gavin then. I met Gavin in Darwin, and um, we for about a good twelve months we we were looking for carpets and we couldn't find any. Um, uh, how how Gavin and I came to meet we we were both uh, both from Adelaide. He'd gone up there with uh, Westpac Bank. He was working on a uh, a program to become a bank manager. He'd just done his economics degree at Flinders, and um, we both found ourselves at this. Um, it was like a conference at the university. There was a lot of uh, reptile research going on up there at the time and I'd been told about it and that there were these, these guys who were working on different things in the reptile uh, world were going to be talking about their work and managed to get a ticket to go and uh, I walked in there and I'm, I'm, I was met by Rick Shine and I was like, 
wow, I was wow. just blown away <laughs> meeting him, you know. And, um, right, sure. Once everyone was sort of seated, they, they sort of went around the room and got everybody to stand up and talk about who they were and why they were there. Well, of course, this room was full of PhDs and, and, and people like that that were doing research, and I just sort of stood up and said, oh, well, you know, I'm just interested in reptiles and I found out about this and came along to to uh, to have a listen and um, and Gavin was the same. He was at the back of the room. So when it came to the break time, we just sort of gravitated to each other and that's how we became friends sort of thing. That was back in 1988. Yeah, late oh, wow, okay. Yeah. So you guys have known each other for a long time. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, um, so, yeah, we just regularly go. Anyway, like I said, we were looking for Darwin carpets, couldn't find any. Um, admittedly, we were mostly doing road cruising, but um, we'd heard that you could get them down near the race course in Darwin. So we went out to look down there, couldn't find any. And then one night I was driving, I, part of my job in the RAF up there was doing mobile patrols. And I was driving around one night and found this massive Darwin carpet in the middle of the dirt track. So I quickly got it and I always had snake hooks and bags with me when I was at work. And uh, bagged it up and t- took it around to his flat the next day and he, he'd gone out barrow fishing and his flatmate was there. And uh, right. I said to him, oh, I've got this big Darwin carpet. And he said, oh, cool. And he came and opened the door and went in. He said, oh, let's have a look at it. And so we got it out of the bag and it had a big tick right in the middle of its head near where the, the parietal scales are. And, uh, right. and he said, oh, look, let's get this tick off. And as he did that, this thing just lunged and it grabbed his whole hand in its mouth. And, and we were standing there in this kitchen and there's just blood running everywhere. We're trying to get the snake off. I uh, just thought it was, it was quite funny. You know, we, we'd been looking for them for so long and then finally found one and that happened. But, um, yeah, that was that was weird. That's awesome. Uh, wow. But, yeah, we did a lot, of, a lot of herping like, through yeah. Litchfield, Litchfield National Park as well because you could go out on okay, that yeah. Cox Peninsula Road through Berry Springs and – We'd enter that way and then go all through the park and come out by Bachelor. Um, actually, one night we were we were there. It was one of those nights where everything's right. The moon phase is right, right time of year. Uh, you know, even your stars in the paper says you're in for a great time when you go herping tonight, you know. <laughs> right. So let, 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 let's go down to Litchfield Park. So we drove down there, as Gavin, myself, and Lee, his flatmate, and um, – Back in those days, we didn't have LED head torches. We had the old school ones with the normal filament bulb, you know, and you'd, you'd put new yeah. batteries in it and by the end of the night it would be going dim, you know. <laughs> and <Right>. uh, <laughs> we, we'd stopped at this bridge uh, over a small small river and um, there'd been nothing on the roads at all. The odd frog jumping across the road, didn't seen one snake and, and yet, you know, all the conditions were supposedly perfect. So we decided to pull over and we walked down through these reeds and spotted this little sort of a puddle, not much more than a six-foot round puddle, I guess, and um, laying in the bottom of this thing. So it was end of the dry season, so all the still water gets quite stained with all the tannins from the leaves, so it's like black tea. And I just managed to make out the outline of a freshwater crocodile laying in this puddle. And um, our, our, our head torches were that bad at this time. The only way we could actually get them on it was by cross, crossing all the beams together and to be able to <laughs> see this thing. So we we're, were just standing there. Um, you know, we've come down the embankment off the road through all these reeds to find this this little body of water. And uh, I, I decided I wasn't satisfied with just looking at this thing laying under the water. So I picked up a little pebble <laughs> and just dropped it, the pebble into the water and it just slowly – filtered down and landed in the middle of this crocodile's back and it just exploded. It just instantly <laughs> turned the water into foam and we all fell on our backs sliding on the mud and it ran between <laughs> us into the reeds that we had to get through to get back up to the car. Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> that was my first encounter with a crocodile in the, in the top end. So, yeah. Okay. Never wow. got that close to any salties, thank God. But, yeah. Oh, man. That's how that I think uh I I love the Northern Territory. I I just oh, thought that bright. it was fantastic. What a trip. Um and uh it was fun. I thought you were gonna say the story of uh we looked for Darwin carpets for the whole trip, and then towards the end of the trip is when we met up with Gavin and he just walks over and he's just like, Oh yeah, there's one right up there. It's like yeah. Son of a bitch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how did he do that? Yeah, you know. Yeah, who would have figured? But, uh, 
the Botanic oh, Gardens, yeah, so. you know, it's yeah. crazy. That's yeah. where I caught my first frill neck lizard was in, in the Botanic Gardens. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 That's cool. We found one that was just, I forget where we were exactly at, but um, it was just on the road. We just found it road cruising. So yeah. Just sitting out there. But uh, Yeah, that's no, okay. a great place. I think every Australian should go and visit Northern Territory for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's something about I, that place. Yeah, it's like, uh, I, 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 it, it's, it's, it reminded me of like, I guess because it doesn't look like anything that you can experience in the States, at least that I've seen. Um, mm. It just looks prehistoric. Uh, I, it just, I don't know, something about it. And it has so many pythons. It was five species of pythons? Yep. You know? Yep. So, yeah, it's crazy. Have you, uh, have you found uh, multiple? Uh, has there been, have you been, well, I guess the question would be, is there a species that you've looked for that have, has eluded you as far as uh, any herpin that you've done or wanted to see? Um, gee. Yeah, woners. I've never seen a woner in the wild. Been to Alice Springs quite a few times and done lots of looking, but never, never been able to see a woner in the wild. Yeah, they seem to be tough to find. Mm. Um, yeah. Wow. Okay. Have you ever kept womas? Uh yeah, I had womas back in the day. Yeah, I had the um, I had a pair of tanamis that were bred by Greg Fife when he was out of the camel farm, and I also had a couple of SA. So in the far north of South Australia, we get womas as well. Um, mm -hmm. They're they're different to the Northern Territory ones. They're more of a sort of a grey sort of colour, and they grow much bigger. They get they hit three metres. They're very, very big. Holy shit. Um, wow. They see a lot of them here around Moomba, around the gas um, operation up there at Moomba. They come through mm -hmm. um, and they, they prey on rabbits. So, yeah, they, they grow really big. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I had some of those back in the day as well. Managed to breed them once. Yeah. I love walmas. I know blackheads, are, at least here in the States, blackheads are – the sought after snake, but I think the, the Woma pythons are super underrated. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. But very cool. Um, let's see what else. Well, I know uh, recently you sort of started to do some naturalistic uh, stuff. Is that yeah, got the bug? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so have I. Um, do you see yourself changing or are you going to do it? See, I seem to be like a balance between the two, like stuff that I'm breeding and stuff. I'm obviously going to keep simpler, I guess, for now. Um, and then, you know, stuff that I want to just observe um, that are, are moving into more naturalistic enclosures. Are you doing something similar or are you going to eventually try to move everything to that setup? Oh look, my all my enteresia there in these these racks here that you can see behind me, they're they're quite large tubs. They've um they've got a, a particle substrate. I've started making right. some uh some hides that are like a bit of a platform they can get under and they can get on top of it as well because they can they can wedge between the roof of the tub uh and or the yeah, you know, the shelf above and, and the hide. So they can sort right. of you know, use that a bit more. Uh, they'll they'll stay in those. They do really well in them. There's plenty of space in there for them, um, and it allows me to keep a reasonable number of animals in a small space. But certainly mm -hmm. everything else, everything else is in enclosures, and that that'll always be the case. And and any time I do an enclosure, I just you know get start working on it well ahead of when I need it, so that I can do a nice naturalistic build and have something that you know really looks looks. Um, looks nice to the eye where do you guys draw inspiration from from your from your builds oh look me was watching um luke beach of scaly beast videos um and then yeah. just i just thought well you know it's very easy to look at that stuff and and say oh i couldn't do that and like the first couple yeah. you do um the first couple i used actual um cement and and that didn't work very well because it dries out and it cracks. This tile pointing is awesome because it's it's made to be flexible. 
It's made to, right. to fit your, your tiles to your roof and it's made to withstand, you know, great variations in temperature and stuff like that and expand and contract and so you don't get any of that cracking. It's very easy to clean even with urates, you know, just a bit of F10 and a toothbrush and then just wipe it off. It's, it's, it's really, really good because that was another consideration. If you've got these sort of setups, you know, it has to be practical. It has to be able to be clean sure. on one of those guys that if I walk in the room and I see some snake feces on there, I've got to get rid of it right away. I can't go, <laughs> right. oh, no, Saturday's cleaning day. You know, I can't do that. Right. So <laughs> I have to be able to live with it in that respect as well. But, um, right. you know, just people, people see it and they go, oh, wow, what have you got in there? Whereas if you just got a cage with newspaper and a bowl and a hide, it's just – yeah, I don't know. I just yeah. can't do that anymore. Yeah. My my dad got back into reptiles recently and um when he's setting up these crazy enclosures for these lizards that he has or whatnot, and uh he never understood he could never understand why I kept snakes in drawers. He's just like, I don't get it. Like what what do you get out of that? I'm just like, Well, I breed them. Yeah, but do you ever look at them or watch them or like, I just don't understand. It didn't make sense to him, you know? So, um, but that's cool. So yeah, it seems like, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe Luke, uh, Luke has had, I know, uh, another one I watch is, uh, cam with, uh, yep, custom cam, backgrounds. Yep. He, he does some, some really amazing stuff, but it's, it's sort of relaxing for me. I don't know about you guys, but it's kind of relaxing to watch them build it almost like, yeah. You know, yeah you know and it's a bit of that too, actually doing it as well now i mean if you, yeah like i said when i did those own pelly enclosures i was sort of halfway through that thing and what the hell have i done i sort of took on too much at once but um, i didn't want to do one and then do the other i want to do them at the same time so that was just a bit of punishment but generally you know working on it and just doing a bit at a time when you've got the time yeah it's just that bit of a yeah. creative outlet as well and yeah it's good right yeah 100 do you do you do you have a when you guys are setting it up? Do you have an idea of what you want it to look like, or does it evolve as you're doing it? Yeah, I tend to do a little bit of a sketch on how I want it to look, and I've got a. I'll, I'll go online and I'll look at habitat photos online. I'll I'll, right. I'll I'll look at you know pictures of the habitat where the animals from. Um, yeah, you know, I'll probably there's probably a bit more I want to do to the old pelly cages. I want to do a bit more with the coloring. I want to get that that sort of ochre colour and they have that black cyanobacteria that you get on all the rocks there and I want to I want right. to improve that a bit. But I'm probably going to do that with an airbrush or something. Um, but, yeah, for the meantime, they're fine as they are. It's funny how your hobby leads you to other hobbies. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like I have this hobby, now I have this other hobby, and now, next thing you know you're airbrushing and, you know, you have to buy all the – equipment for that and everything but yeah you, yeah, you get I mean, to the point where you to me it's not just about the snake it becomes about the whole enclosure and the snake so yeah. you know i mean like you know like you've said before you know you compare us to the aquarium hobby where they pay they get a 20 dollar fish and the aquarium and everything they set up they have to keep it costs them two thousand dollars well yeah you know it, it doesn't make sense you've got a you know a, a high value animal and just put it in a cage with newspaper and you know, some people don't even have a hide. They just let it curl up under the newspaper. Well, I, I just can't do that. Yeah, I think for me what it was too is, um, you know, when you have um, – well, when we were at uh, Crocosaurus Cove, I sort of got some inspiration from some of the enclosures that they had there. But it was – what I noticed is how different the animal looks when it's not in a, you know, newspaper, water bowl type of thing when you have it in this natural setup all of us like uh, for instance daniel your chondra that's sort of just behind you right there it's just you know i don't know it just sort of has like a different look than it's in this sterile type yeah. of cage you know it, yeah. it, it's like you're getting the snake and the wild i guess too herping in your snake room is is what i call it you know so you can just kind of yeah get yourself a coffee and just watch what's going on you know yeah um, i don't know part of the fun of it you know all right um okay i guess uh we have these closing questions that will hit i don't know is there anything else that you guys wanted to hit on any other things you want to talk about as far as chondros or daniel 
advice? What would be your advice to somebody that's uh, that wants to get into chondros? What would you, what would be the one thing that you would tell them? Um, I would, you know, research yourself. You know, a very well known breeder. Um, you know, if you're a first time um, acquirer, you know, if you can get yourself a yearling animal at the first, like you know, they're quite robust at that age, but um, you know, if you want to get it younger, you, you want to make sure it's really well established and it's had, you know, um, you know, probably in excess of 10 feeds and you probably want it to be, you know, um, you know three months plus before, before you acquire that animal. But um, just, yeah, just do lots of research. And um, the good thing in the chondro community, like um, everyone's got the time of day to just talk about whatever questions you have, like everyone's just willing to help. You know, not keep things sure. to themselves. So, like, there's just mm. so many good guys out there that you can talk to, um, and probably um, just some other advice. I guess, like, um, you know, quite often you, you see it on the Facebook pages. Quite often, someone will get themselves a hatchy, and they popped it in this glass exoterra tank. You know, and they just, you know, they had it in there for a little while, and it's just not working out for them. Um, is that just don't really do well in a glass enclosure. I, you know, a, a young conjurer, I, you know, set up in a nice, simple tub, with some paper towel, some appropriate perching and a water bowl. Um, and you get that dialed in and they just, once you've got those basic parameters set up or something like that, they're, they're generally really easy to keep. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like that once you do have them dialed in, they're, pr they're pretty much, yeah, you're you're pretty good. It's just getting that, you know, dialing it in exactly right. But I'm with you as far as uh, I should say that because we we're just talking about naturalistic enclosures for babies. I think that you can't beat tubs, you know, yeah. for hatchlings yeah. and stuff. Like, yeah. I mean, that's just like the greatest, uh, you know, way to keep, in my opinion, you know, because um, yeah. you can observe what's going on with them. You know, you uh, you know, yeah. especially if you're keeping a, a simple sump straight and stuff like that. I think that's sometimes has to get lost in that conversation. Um, but, uh, cool. Do you, you know, I, I would think, uh, here's a, a question I have for you as far as like, if, if chondras are so expensive, right. You really probably don't have like what I call uh, window shoppers, so to speak, that, that don't do the research. I mean, if you're going to spend that much on a, on a, on a, on a snake or a reptile, you probably have done research, no? Do you find that a lot of people come yeah, in the yeah. chondro community with like knowledge it. already? Yeah, generally, like most, um, I've helped a few guys out here in South Australia in getting them on the right track to get their licensing and stuff like that. And um, they generally do do a lot of research. And um, when they come to talking to me, they're sort of you know, well prepared already. They really do look into it. Um, yeah, like some of the you can spend you know, five thousand dollars plus. Like, you want to make right. sure. Yeah, one one good thing with the rules down here. Yeah, with with the rules we've got here uh, to have things like green pythons, um, pelly scrub pythons, you have to have a specialist license. So, okay. you, and, and in order to get that, you need um, a certain number of years' experience. You need a couple of um, I guess references, letters. I know Daniel's done that for a couple of people. I think I did that for you when you got your specialist permit. Um, so you need you need that. So you've already got a bit of knowledge, and and you've you've got some contacts already to to be able to get the license to be able to have them. Um, the yeah. people in in pet shops, etc., tend to not yeah. like it because people won't walk into a pet shop and buy that animal because of that specialist license right. requirement, but within the hobby and within private breeders, um, yeah, it's, it's not a problem. So, you know, well, this is, uh, actually let's sit on this for a second. Cause this is an interesting, cause we're from two different dynamics right here. It's sort of, well, it depends on what state you're in, but it's kind of the, so here in Pennsylvania, you pretty much can own whatever you want. Um, without license or anything like that. And sometimes I think that that's a bad thing. And I know that like putting restrictions and stuff, you know, a lot of times is can be scary. I don't know. Like, you know, people are hesitant to sort of put those rules in place. Um, 
I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you think? I, but it seems like for the long haul, it probably is better for the animal and mm-hmm. even the keeper as far as the, you know, they've done all this work to be able to keep this animal that they're going to pay, uh, pay more attention to it or, or, or to give better care, uh, I guess yeah. is the word. I don't know. What do you guys think? Am, am I wrong in thinking that way? Uh, I think, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I think, um, I, I think it's um, a really good thing the way they do the licensing here and they, you know, they really look into it. Um, I've had um, a lady at the licensing department, she's, you know, rung me up to discuss that particular application because she was, you know, a little bit iffy in the way the application was put together. So, and right. I think it's really good because in the end, the animals are going to get looked after. Um, I think if, you know, anyone could just pick up a green tree python as their first snake without really any experience with any other species, it can go downhill real quick. Yeah, I, I've seen it firsthand. I mean, there are sometimes like there's these exceptions. Well, there's exceptions to all rules, right? You know, uh, there are some people that their first snake was a chondro and they got it. And for whatever reason, they were able to it, it, probably they were really excited about getting a chondro, I would imagine, you know, uh, which, you know, when you are excited about wanting to work with a species, you're probably going to be more, um, you know, uh, into making sure that you're giving it the best care you can. Yeah, um, but uh, I think more times than not, those chondros that are $300 at a reptile show are yeah. probably not living mm. past a year, you know? Um, <laughs> so I don't know. I find that interesting though, because do you, do you find that like, it doesn't seem like they're trying to keep you from getting it do you have trouble with getting the permit pro- providing that you do all the the stipulations that you have to do to get no, it not at all. like um you just follow the process and you can clearly yeah. show that you've got um the knowledge behind you to keep that species there um they'll approve that um specialist permit pretty easily um just as long as you know you take the time and put something to them that right. shows that you're capable um, there's no issues at all. Now, do they do that with other animals as well, or is it just reptiles that you have to do that with? Like with birds or fish or anything like that? Anything native. So, yeah, native birds. Uh, there are people here who keep things like sugar gliders and, and things like that. So, yeah, the, all those animals are covered. Um, okay. The, the bird hobby is a little bit different. The yeah, the uh, some some reptile keepers have a bit of a beef with the aquarium hobby and the bird hobby, and that they can have birds or fish from anywhere in the world. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I look, I, I don't, I, I honestly think, yeah, there was times when I was younger where I thought, yeah, it'd be great to have, you know, um, Fiji and banded iguanas or something like that, you know. But I really think we've got some amazing reptiles in this country, and. I can honestly say I, there's nothing that I want from overseas with what I've got in my collection. I mean, I'm biased. I love Australian reptiles. I just don't think you can get be- any better. I mean, why would you want anything else? I mean, everybody tells me all the time about all these wonderful snakes we have here in the U.S. And I'm like, yeah, they're, they're, sure. Yeah, that's cool. But, <laughs> that's, you know, <laughs> this is much cooler. <laughs> but, you know. Rattlesnakes are pretty cool, but I wouldn't keep them. Mm. All right. Um, okay. So I guess you answered that one question, but uh, if you, so here's going to be uh, the, the closing questions that we have. So um, I don't know who wants to go first, but if you could keep one species, just one species, and that's it, I think I know what you're going to say, Daniel, but uh, <laughs> what would it be? <laughs> Yeah, for me, it's, it's hands down the condo. That's it. Okay. Uh, I, do awesome. like, I do like the emeralds and the basins as well. They're, they're cool. I would be open to those guys. Okay. Okay. What about you, Darren? I've already got them. Oh, Pellies. 
Ah, fair, <laughs> <laughs> fair play. Um, yeah. Here's an interesting one. Has there been a species that you've tried to breed and failed um, and can't figure out why? Um, no, I can't really think of anything. There you go. All right. <laughs> uh, even even the, the, the small monitors we have, we managed to breed those. Um, no, not really. Okay. All right. We'll have to talk again when your Owen Pellies are of size to breed, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be a challenge. All right. Um, how about you, Daniel? Have, has there been anything that you've... I yeah, mean, look, I haven't really... Like, this is essentially me getting into my first aid as a breeding. Uh, when I was keeping my carpets and womers and blackheads and whatnot, um, like I said, I, all I really wanted to do was get in the chondros and at, at that stage when I was keeping those animals, you know, they were, they were so cheap and I didn't want to just breed them for the sake of it and, you know, be caught with animals that were you know, hard to move on. Right. So I'm um, generally only sort of just getting into the breeding stage of my keeping at the moment. So, yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Um, has there been a species that you could have had and you passed on and you regret passing or a specific animal that you know uh, whether it be a more for locality or something like that at the moment i did part i had to pass on a um biak outcross animal it was a stunning the parents were a stunning pair but um right I've got, I've got a couple of other Neos on the way. They've got a bit of a special connection because the grand side to that clutch was a Biak that Bab used to keep. So mm. I messaged with Charles. Ah, Charles. Okay. I was like, that's awesome. Like, I'd love to get a couple of offspring. You know, it's got a connection to my dad. That'd be really cool. So, um, yeah. 100%. Wow. Okay. Do you guys, uh, this is an off topic question, but do you guys keep like lineage stuff for chondros? Do you do that at all? Um, there's definitely keepers that do. Um, right. But as far Marcus as. Marcus Cervac was big on that. Yeah. Who there's is? definitely a number of guys that are, but I don't have a lot of background history on a lot of mine. Uh, okay. I don't have that trail. Yeah. There used to be a guy up in Cairns, um, who had quite a collection of green pythons and he used to keep them inside and outside. He had outside enclosures and they were sort of all mesh and they had live plants and everything in them. And he, he used to keep a lot of uh, lineage on different animals. Um, mm -hmm. He contacted me because he was Michael Cermak. Cermak? Yeah. Yeah, Cermak. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he, he doesn't have snakes anymore, but um, yeah, there's some really one of there's one of Peter Birch's videos. He actually goes and visits him when he had them so you can see them. And uh, yeah. yeah, he was he was very big on lineage keeping. Okay, yeah, his uh, outside enclosures that he had was oh, man, mm. holy hell, wow, that was nice. Um, so the next question we have is, uh, what one piece of advice would you give the reptile community? Oh, I'll go first. Um, okay. Look, look beneath the surface. Don't just see something and think that's cool. I want to get it. Do do research. Do the right thing by the animal. Have a think about why it is you want to keep reptiles and and try not to approach it from the point of view of a dog or a cat, because that will ensure the best outcome for your animals, and it will probably ensure that you'll stay in the hobby for a long period of time and get more out of it. All right, that's a good one. Okay. What about you, Daniel? Um, I guess I probably something I see quite often is you know, sometimes on a, on a social page, you might get someone asking a question to them, which is genuine, but comes across to someone like it's a bit of a stupid question when they sort of get, you know, smashed online for it. I think sometimes, um, sometimes we just probably need to chill and take the time to try and help them understand what it is they're wanting to know. Um, sometimes right. it's pretty bad. <laughs> sometimes it's pretty bad. <laughs> it can turn you off reptile keeping pretty quickly, I imagine. 
if yes. you're able to yeah. know what you have to get out of Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. Okay. Um, so what, is, so there's two more. What is the hardest lesson you've learned while keeping reptiles? Um, oh, for me, it's probably easy acquiring, um, green tree pythons far too young, but aren't established. Um, okay. Yeah, I lost a bit there. It's probably one of my biggest learnings. I'll never acquire another animal that's under the age of three months without, um, good feed feeding pattern already. Yeah. I've suffered that same fate. Uh, I bought a, a big group of, uh, Manaquaris that came in and I think I had like seven of them. Right. And I thought that I was able to get them going. <laughs> nope. Nope. So bummer. What about you, Darren? <laughs> uh, I would say making sure you have good security. Um, you know, back in back in the day when I had my so green pythons were always my pinnacle animal, and um, right. like I said, I you know I, I kept reptiles on a very low level, like as a teenager, as a kid. Um, but you know, when I got into snakes, you know, I was mainly breeding jungles and stuff like that. The uh, the green pythons became available, so you know we we pulled the trigger and bought bought a, a couple of hatchlings and. Um, Spent you know two and a half years raising them up um, and bred them in two thousand and two thousand and five is when they hatch. So yeah, October two thousand and five. Um, sold a few of those babies, but that was a sort of a joint thing with my my father in law at the time. He sort of paid for one, I paid for the other. So you know we sort of was, would split the whatever money we made. And, you know, half was his sort of thing because I couldn't afford to buy two of my own and. Um, when those animals got to about seven, eight months, uh, we had an armed home invasion at home and they were all stolen oh, wow. at, at gunpoint. Wow. Um, and, you know, one of the things, you know, I mean, you, you can never prepare yourself for something like that. But, you right. know, if I had had some better, you know, cameras and stuff like that around, I might have had a better chance of, you know, the, the police might have had a better chance of finding that person and, and prosecuting that crime. But... Um, as it turns out, they didn't, and you know that guy walked out of the house with well over a hundred k worth of animals, based on pricing wow. at the time, and wow. uh, and that, and you know I I completely left the hobby for seven years, nearly eight years, didn't didn't keep one thing, it just completely burned me, you know. Um, sure. So you wow. know now I'm obviously a lot more aware of stuff like that. We've got lots of cameras around the place and and all that sort of thing, and you know I just think. Yeah, you know, anywhere where any high value animal is involved, uh, you've got to have that awareness. You know, not everyone out there has positive intent, and right. um, yeah. You, yeah, so that was a really hard lesson. Wow, wow. Yeah, That's I had people rough. calling me from. Oh, Greg Maxwell called me. He saw it on the news there in the states. Oh, uh, really? My, my wow. yeah, my my half brother in the UK. It was on the news there as well. Like, it's just a very unusual crime, I guess. But um, yeah. Wow. That's crazy, man. And when, uh, how long ago was that? In 2006. Six. Okay. Yeah. Yikes. Man. All right. Um, if you could start keeping reptiles over again, would you change anything? Would there be anything that you would change? And if it was, what would it be? Well, I guess from my perspective, I've done it in the old days with all the, the basic sort of caging yeah. setup. So, you know, to, to, it's like I've already done that now, embracing all this new technology and the stuff that's available now to make it so much easier. Um, so I guess I've sort of lived through that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. Okay. What about you, Daniel? Um, I mean, I know you're kind of, you know, you don't I have years for, under your belt, per yeah, se, but... that, I guess for me, I, I was lucky. I always had dad there to, you know, keep me on the right track, um, more or, right. or less. Um, I think just always more research and more research and, and just learning coming into it um, is is really vital. 
Yeah. Yeah. I thought you were going to say I would never get carpets. I would just go straight to Condros. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's the evolution thing, isn't it? Yeah. You. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's carpets are usually the stepping stone, right? Because they're a little more bulletproof, I guess, if you will, to get your mm. keeping experience down. Um, you got to start somewhere, I guess. You know, but very cool. Um, I don't know. Uh, social media, anything you guys want to share, you want to put out there so people can follow you, see what you have going on. Uh, how can people find you? Um, yeah, I guess if anyone's interested in following my journey, you can um, follow my Facebook page and Instagram account, Andro underscore Boz. Um, yeah, hopefully I'll have some cool things happening with the with the Aussies this year. And yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, best of luck with that. Um, Thanks. That'll be cool to see for sure. How about you, Darren? Yeah, I don't have a Same. Facebook page as such. Uh, I tend to mainly just post stuff into some of the groups that I'm in on Facebook. Uh, but gotcha. I do I do have Instagram, so it's Python underscore Boz on, on Instagram. So that's, that tends okay. to be more where I upload photos to and stuff like that. So, yeah, I can be contacted either way. Okay. It seems like, uh, I don't know if you guys are feeling the same thing, but it seems like a lot of people are moving to Instagram yeah. and away from Facebook. Um, it seems to be more uh, positive vibes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. seeing cool, cool reptiles rather than uh, mm -hmm. debating nonsense and bullshit and whatever mm -hmm. else is going on. And, <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. cool. Um, well, I appreciate, uh, you guys coming and hanging out. Uh, it's, I know it's morning time for you. It's, uh, nighttime for, for me, but, uh, glad we could make it work. Sorry, Owen wasn't here. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate you guys coming on and, uh, chatting with us. So no, that's great. Yeah, great, to, great to be on. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you, everybody, for listening. That will do it for us here in this episode. And if you want to find out more about us, everything you need to know is over at MoreaPythonRadio.com. Go check it out. See all the cool things that we have going on. Um, please follow us on Instagram and Facebook, NPR Network, and go over and check out our YouTube channel, NPR Network, uh, where all the shows and various live streams and such can be found so what we will say is thank you for listening to npr 